the title which uh, has been given uh, to my presentation is rather challenging, as you can imagine. The title reads, uh, Enhancing uh, uh, Integral Human Development, the uh, Proposal of Civil Economy. So let me start uh, from the beginning uh, uh, indicating the thesis that I'm going to defend uh, in this brief presentation. The thesis is uh, the following. There is today a general consensus, as Professor Avila just mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, about among both economists and social scientists at large about uh, the urgency to reform and to transform certain parts uh, of our, let's say, prevailing model of social order, and at the same time to modify a central parts uh, of the intellectual paradigm in economics uh, which has been uh, brought to us uh, in recent times. And uh, there is uh, also a, a, a great awareness on the fact that uh, uh, the two major factors explaining uh, this necessity of m reforming and transforming at the, the same times are both the globalization and the third industrial revolution the revolution of the, of the so-called digital revolution. As you know, globalization and third industrial revolution in themselves have nothing to do. But for the first time in the history of mankind, these two phenomena occurred at the same time. Because as we know, globalization started at the beginning of the 80s uh, of last century, at the time when uh, the third industrial revolution started uh, being introduced at the beginning in the United States uh, and then uh, in Europe and the rest of the world, uh, etc. On the other hand, uh, that is the point, uh, there is no consensus about uh, the direction that should be taken in order to move uh, a step forward uh, to cope with the major problems and challenges uh, of our epoch. That is uh, the point. There is a consensus that something has to be done, that we cannot continue repeating uh, an old wisdom, as sometimes is said. On the other hand, uh, there is no consensus, no convergence on uh, uh, the way we should carry this uh, uh, project, and in particular, which elements uh, should be changed or modified accordingly. My proposal that it uh, gives the meaning of the title of this presentation, is that the civil economy perspective might be a proper way to answer the challenges we are talking about almost every day, and uh, a proposal which, as I can see, moving around in the world, in particular in the Anglo-Saxon world, in particular both in England and the United States, can achieve a certain degree of convergence. That is the thesis that uh, now I am going to defend. And first of all, it is important to start with the explicatio terminorum. In the old de happy days, uh, when people used to speak in Latin, the word level, and not in English, Explicatio terminor was, uh, the, as St. Thomas taught us, uh, the first day. First of all, you have to explain uh, the meaning uh, of the words or the concept that you are using. And in this case, uh, let me say a few words uh, to the civil economy paradigm or the civil economy view. The civil economy paradigm uh, has uh, its roots uh, in a particular historical context and in a particular environment, namely humanism, 15th century, where Tuscany, Florence, was the cradle of the civil economy paradigm. And uh, this um, um, paradigm, and paradigm, as you know, it's a, it's a Greek word. If you want to use a non-Greek word, you can use the word berillo. Berillo, it's a mineral. Niccolò Cusano, Cusano was German, but he studied in Padua. He, used a, he published a, at the end of the 15th century an important book. Uh, the title was On Berillo. And was a mineral which had the following property. If you go through, if you uh, try to see things through this mineral, you observe things that without, with a, a simple eyes, you cannot see. In a sense, a Berillo is what nowadays are glasses. Now, a paradigm is a berillo in this particular sense. It's a view, it's not a theory. 
It's not a model. Within the same paradigm, you can uh, develop many models and many theories. But it's a particular way you observe reality and you judge reality. So that is the uh, uh, way I use the word paradigm. As I said, it started uh, the time of humanism, that it continues uh, the following century, the Escuela de Salamanca, Salamanca School, and went on until the 18th century, the century of enlightenment, but not French enlightenment, because French enlightenment is something completely different from both the Scottish enlightenment and the Italian enlightenment. And um, to conclude on this uh, historical uh, brief report, you should know that uh, the University of Naples in 1753 established during the Bourbons period, because southern Italy was under the Bourbons, as you know, the first chair of economics in the world. I stress it again, in the world. And it was denominated the chair of economia civile, in other words, a civil economy. 1753. So the first economist was not first important economist, Adam Smith, because Adam Smith was a philosopher and he had the chair of moral philosophy in uh, Scotland. Where, but the first chair was, and the first uh, chairperson was um, a, a, a man called Antonio Genovesi. Antonio Genovesi, who lately uh, published his book, textbook, as we call it today, the title is Lectures on Civil Economy, which for many decades represented the textbooks over which many students uh, uh, prepare their studies, etc. Et then uh, after that period, it expanded uh, in northern Italy, in particular in Milan, and uh, also in other parts, etc. Uh, so when I say civil economy paradigm, we refer to a typical Neolatin tradition to which uh, Spain, uh, Italy, not France, France is a neo latin country, but the French people always rejected uh, the civil economy paradigm. And that is, I have no time to give reasons for that, but that is interesting to keep it in mind, etc. Now, having said so, the question then is, what are the three major, let's say, uh, challenges that the civil economy paradigm uh, brings about uh, in order to criticize the still uh, prevalent way of doing uh, in economic thinking. In other words, uh, the civil economy paradigm challenges uh, three specific forms of reductionism in uh, mm, the, the still prevalent economic thinking. The first one is the so-called anthropological reduction. Those of you who studied economics, I'm, I take it that most of you have studied some economics, they know that the anthropological assumption is that of Homo economicus. Now, Homo economicus is a metaphor which was coined in the mid uh, uh, of the 19th century by John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill was an economist and also a philosopher, an important philosopher. And he coined uh, this expression in order to ridiculize it. But after a few decades, an Italian economist whose name was Wilfredo Pareto took this expression and made it uh, the basis of all uh, economic theorization. Now, you know who is an homo economicus? He's an individualist and uh, a self interest person. In other words, homo economicus is uh, an agent who is individualist. Individualist means that it puts uh, the source of value in what the individual thinks. In other words, there are no objective values, only subjective values. Value is what I decide. I mean, the value of this bottle is what I decide you should have. That is the meaning uh, of individualism in the theory of value. Self-interested is uh, very well known. Somebody who, in his or her action, operates in order to maximize uh, his or her utility function. So the civil economy, co uh, civil economy paradigm challenges this form of reduction. And the starting point on the anthropological front of civil economy is that of homo reci reciprocans, not homo economicus. In other words, homo reciprocans is an individual, or better to say, a person who 
in his or her operation applies the principle of reciprocity. I will say a few words about reciprocity uh, later in this conversation. And uh, if you want to characterize the two anthropological assumptions, we can say homo economicus accept the Hobbesian, homo homini lupus. You know Thomas Hobbes, 1651, the year when he published the Leviathan, where he started exactly with this assumption, which is an assumption, not a theorem. He says, I assume that every man is a wolf vis-a-vis -vis the other man, homo homini lupus. As you know, Hobbes uh, obtained this expression. He did not coin it, he, because this expression was created many centuries before by Plautus, a, a Latin uh, who came from, uh, from Spain, I believe, uh, a, a Latin author. But it is true that it was uh, Hobbes uh, who gave to this uh, assumption the, uh, the importance of being a sort of a pillar of the theoretical construction. On the other hand, the anthropological assumption of the civil economy paradigm is homo homini natura amicus. Homo homini natura amicus. If you read the book by Genovesi, in the, the esergo, in the first page, you find uh, this expression, which means every man is by nature, by nature, a friend to another man. In practice, sometimes uh, even friends quarrel, make conflict. But that is different. It's a, a fact. But uh, on a, let's say, ontological ground, the civil economy economist believes that uh, everybody is uh, ontologically a friend towards the other. So this is the, the first difference between the two, let's say, paradigms I'm talking about. The second difference has to do with the Let's say that form of reductionism which uh, operates within uh, the uh, world of corporations, what microeconomists call the, the theory of the firm, the theory of corporation. For the political economy paradigm, in other words, the prevalent paradigm still nowadays in action, the only purpose of a firm is profit maximization. Second, labor is a uh, factor of production. Those of you who studied microeconomics, we usually start the theory of the firm with the production function. And we say output is a function of uh, materials, capitals, machines, and labor. In other words, labor is put at the exactly the same level as the other inputs of production, in such a way that you can always have a trade-off among them, a bit more one, instead of the other, etc. The civil economy paradigm says uh, starts from a different approach. Namely, the firm is, first of all, a, cum a community of human beings. It's not a commodity in itself. Those of you who studied Jensen, an Ameri famous American economist, he says the firm as a commodity. In other words, a firm should be treated as if it were a commodity. What do you do with the commodity? You buy and sell according to the convenience. And uh, if somebody says, but you know that uh, in that particular commodity that we call firm, there are people, human beings working, says, never mind. Because we do not consider the person as such. We only consider the extraction of the labor force from the person. The civil economist, on the other hand, consider, as I said, the firm as a community. And as a consequence of that, uh, labor is visualized as a vocation, as a vocation. In other words, as opus. You know that there is a difference between uh, labor as an activity and labor as opus. Labor as activity means uh, any things that can be done which transforms the object to which you apply your attention. To say labor is an opus means that while we work, we transform also ourselves. Not only the object, but also the subject of action. And as you can see, that makes a major difference. And if you start from such a premise, you, premise, you develop a completely different theory of the firm from the other, uh, from the one that 
has been developed starting from the other premise. Finally, the third major difference difference between the two research programs has to do with the reductionism concerning uh, the source uh, of value. In other words, um, for the uh, mainstream economics, uh, the purpose of the economics system is uh, to maximize the ultimate purpose, uh, the rate of growth of GDP. GDP. What has been today is a sort of a new mantra, etc. In fact, you evaluate the performance of a country, whatever, in terms uh, of this parameter. Uh, the country which develops uh, at uh, a rate of growth GDP 7% per year, that is the case of China, India. Today, China is, seems to be 6.5, but more or less that was the case, is considered at a higher level than another country with a lot. On, in other words, uh, the purpose, uh, on the other hand, of the civil economy paradigm is uh, to develop as much as possible integral human development. Now, what do we mean by integral human development? A integral human development possesses three dimensions. One is the material dimension, and the material dimension has to do with GDP. Because, of course, we need commodities. We need things to eat, uh, to drink, etc. That is obvious. But that is one component of the integral human development. There are the other two components, namely the relational component and the spiritual component. So, for the civil economist, a country develops properly if it is capable of managing keeping the three dimensions in equilibrium. In equilibrium means, uh, in a, perhaps it's better to use a different word, in harmony, in harmony. On the other hand, for the mainstream economics, only the first dimension is taken into consideration. Provided that you maximize uh, the material dimension expressed by the GDP indicator, you are OK. Because the assumption is that the purpose of economic activity is exactly that, nothing else, etc. So already at this point uh, you understand uh, the, uh, the differences between the two uh, berillos, between the two uh, intellectual paradigms, etc. To conclude uh, on the third uh, uh, point, uh, namely that uh, uh, concerning the ultimate purpose, as I was saying before, before entering this room to some friends, uh, exactly two days ago, to the, in Rome, it was uh, the presentation of the World Happiness Index of, uh, uh, referring to last year. Now, this is an initiative which was taken by the United Nations, and uh, there is a group of scholars based in New York, located at Columbia University, who take care of the, let's say, statistical and econometric manipulation of data. And uh, in this report of this year, there is the ranking of happiness of 157 different countries, which means um, virtually all the countries in the world, apart from North Korea and a few others who do not give the data to the statistical office. They give something else. Uh, now, if you read uh, this, uh, you see the, the index of the countries. In the f this year, which means uh, last year, the number, the first country is Denmark, second Switzerland, Iceland, Norway, Finland, Canada, Netherlands, etc. Spain is uh, number 37. Italy is number 50. In other words, we are worse than you. We are less happy than you. Uh, so you see. <laughs> well, because it was uh, uh, yesterday, two days ago, it was presented officially in, in Rome. Then yesterday, there was uh, another presentation inside the Vatican uh, with Cardinal Ravasi. He is the, uh, the president of the Pontifical Council of Culture. 
And that was also presented to the Pope. And the Pope Francis started laughing. He said, how is it possible? I don't believe to this. Day. I do not know econometrics. But it is impossible that Italians are number 50 in the order. Because I always, when I go around, I see always uh, uh, Italians who are cheerful, uh, singing, enjoying, etc. But he was a consideration which, um, by a wise man, I close down the parenthesis. In other words, um, if we, at that point, uh, we are prepared to understand uh, that what are the major consequences stemming from the three different, uh, let's say, assumptions uh, I was talking about. The first one referring to the anthropological assumption, the second one referring to the nature of the firm, the third one referring to the purpose of economic activity. Let me stress a few of these consequences. The first one has to do with the fact that uh, the civil economy paradigm refuses the NOMA. The NOMA, let, since I, there is a blackboard, uh, let me use. NOMA is a, an acronym, English acronym, NOMA, which means non-overlapping magisteria. Non-overlapping magisteria. Now, this... Uh, acronym was coined uh, for the first time in 1829 by the English economist Richard Watley. And the most economists uh, never mention that. That is part of the game. Because mainstream economics does not want to, that the students know these things. Now, Richard Watley, he had the chair of economics in the University of Oxford. University of Oxford. And he was very influential. And he was very influential also for another reason. Because lately, he became bishop of the Anglican Church. And as you know, in England, to be the bishop, the head of the Anglican Church, gives you a, a power, even political, not only. But he was professor of economics. Now, during the inauguration of the new academic year, 1829, no, um, Watley announced the principle of NOMA, is, which says the following. If economics wants to be, uh, be considered a science according to the positivistic uh, mode uh, of epistemology, then it should cut any link with both ethics and politics. In other words, uh, society is made up of uh, three spheres. The spheres of ethics, the spheres of politics uh, and the sphere of economics. Okay? And uh, the three spheres are independent one from the other. That is why, since uh, that period, apart from few exceptions, most economists, almost the, the totality, consider economics uh, something different from ethics. And th the origin of that exactly was in that period. Of course, it took some years. For instance, John Stuart Mill was against NOMA. But then he passed away. And already at the time of the marginalistic revolution, 1871-73, uh, that was taken for granted. In other words, uh, eco e economists should not bother about the ethical dimension. From a certain point of view, Watley, he had a uh, a pinch of salt, a grain of truth in his argument. Because he said, what is the role of ethics? That of fixing the rules of behavior. What is accepted and what should not be accepted. What is the role of political sphere? That of fixing the targets that a society wants to achieve. What is the role of economics, of the economic sphere? That of finding the means. That is why, even today, in most uh, textbooks, you find the usual Robbins uh, definition of economics as the science which, due to the scarcity of resources, finds the optimal or most efficient means to achieve certain ends. I quoted by heart, but that is the substance. Now, this is a definition, but where does it come from? Exactly from that. Because, uh, you see, the economists used to say the ends are fixed uh, by the politicians under the control of the ethicist who decides where 
an end is, uh, uh, let's say, ac should be accepted or not. And finally, the economists are those who find the means. And so the means have nothing to do with ethics. And if something goes wrong, economists used to say, you should uh, make uh, the responsibility on the ethic ethicist or on the politicians, because we economists are technicians. That is why, since that period of economics, eh, which was uh, created uh, in Greek by Aristotle, the word economics is a Greek word, started being parts uh, of uh, the so-called techne, uh, technical reasons. As you know, in the old uh, philosophy, metaphysics, there were three forms of uh, reasons. Practical reasons, a technical reasons, and the metaphysics. Now, until that period, economics was part of practical reasons. Since the normal principles, it became part of technical reasons, what the uh, Greek called techne, etc. Now, that is uh, the first uh, consequence. And so that is why when today we observe that in the last few decades, there is a sort of resurgence. That is the novelty about which uh, we have to be aware. And fortunately, there are institutions, departments, universities, this is one of them, where this question of reconnecting economics and ethics is pursued. But in most universities, that has not yet been done, even today. Not been done. You might find some economists who know ethical principles. That is true. But they never feel, in a sense, uh, obliged to apply those ethical principles in their economic theorizing. They know it uh, as a person, because perhaps they... But if you ask them, but don't you feel that when you propose a theory of the markets, or market, labor market, or financial market, your ethics has something to do with what you propose, they say, no, that is a uh, different thing. That is what uh, some people call it uh, schizoid behavior. Schizophrenia means uh, separation, when you are separated, etc. The second consequence of stemming from um, the different premises between the two paradigms is the fact that for mainstream economics, the ultimate purpose of economic game is maximization of total good. For the civil economy, is common good. Now, common good is not to be confused with total good, even though most people confuse the two. And uh, some times ago, for the benefit of the students, my students, I found a sort of uh, arithmetical metaphor, a metaphor eh, which has to be interpreted to clarify the issue. You see, if we can represent uh, the total good, uh, the total good as the sum total, as the sum total of individual good. In other words, uh, a sum total of individual good. Let me indicate with GI the good of individual I. You, and uh, suppose there are N individuals in our society, to maximize the total good means to maximize the sum total. In other words, G1 plus G2 plus G3, Gn. On the other hand, uh, the, co the notion of common good is not that of a sum total, but is that of a product, a product between one and of personal individual good, which means G1 multiplied G2 multiplied, etc. Now you understand immediately the, the meaning of the metaphor, arithmetical method. In a sum total, even though certain addenda, they are called addenda, disappears, the sum remains positive. Not only remains positive, but it is possible that if I cancel this and I transfer resources from this individual or this group of individuals to the others, if the others are more efficient than this one, the sum total increases, which is what happens in our society. Suppose that uh, this group of people are less efficient than them. My, if my point is to maximize the sum total, I say, what's the point of giving them the resources? It's better to transfer resources from your hands 
to this group. They are more efficient, and so they will maximize or they will produce more than what you have been done. But in the logic of the common good, that is not possible. Because if you nullify the good, I use the good uh, as a generic word, as you can understand, of one group, the total product goes to zero. Because zero multiplied one billion is zero. Zero plus one billion is one billion. So you see the meaning of the metaphor. In the logic uh, of the civil economy, nobody can be left behind. Of course, should be differences, because we are not all equal. We do not have all of us the same talents, and that is good in my opinion. That is good, because life otherwise would be very, very boring if we were exactly one replica of the others. But one thing is to admit that, another thing is to say, let's forget about uh, those who cannot uh, stand up. And uh, now, I have no time, but you immediately understand the implication, for instance, uh, in the area of economic development. <laughs> Why there are still areas w of the world where, in spite of the fact that we live in the year 2016, in the epoch of the digital revolution, to mean a situation where that thing still there are many local populations lagging behind. Because the argument is exactly that of the total good. But the notion of common good, common means uh, together. Common has the same root uh, as the word as communion. Communion and common have the same root, original root, about which one has to, to think. Etc. Finally, the third and major consequence has to do with the notion of the market economy itself. For the civil economy, the market is a place of mutual advantage. That is a, an application of the principle of reciprocity. On the other hand, for the mainstream, you will never read in any paper or book of mainstream economists this expression, mutual advantage. Because uh, the market is interpreted as, a, a, let's say, a device to select, to, uh, to not discriminate, but to select. Uh, but uh, mutuality is different because uh, and the new notion of mutuality is linked, uh, as you can understand, uh, to the notion of, uh, uh, of common good, uh, etc. So now, let me come to the second part uh, of my presentation. The question is, OK, more or less we have understood the major differences between the two paradigms, what I call mainstream and what I call the civil economy paradigm. But show to me, that could be the, uh, the question, that uh, what has today the civil economy paradigm to offer in the solution of the problems uh, and the challenges affecting our societies? Let me indicate a few of them. First, the growing gap between uh, creative jobs and routine jobs. Now, a recent uh, research by Oxe, Oxe located in Paris, has uh, calculated that the percentage of creative jobs in our countries, Western countries, is more or less 25%. 25%. Which means that the remaining 75% are routine jobs. Jobs for which uh, there is no need to study that much, provided that you can read, uh, write, um, basic culture, it will be enough. Now, you might ask me, so what? <laughs> that is a serious problem. Because I'm sure that you read the article by Fry and Osborne two economists from Oxford, or the recent uh, work by Jeffrey Sachs and others about the introduction of robots, the new, new generation of robots. They are called intelligent robots. Because the ones that we have now, we are, they are not intelligent. You know what does mean intelligent? Intelligent robot is a robot who, which is able to correct itself. On the other hand, the robots nowadays, if they do some mistakes, you have to reset them. So if a robot can correct itself, 
it is obvious that it will displace, or better to say, uh, yes, displace uh, those people who are committed to routine jobs. So the question that Fry and Osborne calculated with reference to the American, eh, American labor market is that in the next 20 years, unless something is done, 47 percent of the American labor force will remain without jobs. 47. Now, these are two economists from Oxford, and uh, everybody in the world today is talking about this uh, asset because it's frightening, as you can imagine. And they exactly they say, those belonging to the 25 percent, the top 25, they have no problem because they are creative people. They will uh, innovate, blah, blah, blah. But is everybody compelled to be very intelligent, to be able to innovate? Suppose that I start from the premise I mentioned before, that for me, labor is a vocation. So can I say to somebody, well, you stay out of the labor process because uh, you are not creative? That is a value judgment. Eh? Because, uh, you see, if you are lazy and you are not uh, willing to work, it's a different thing. That is uh, different. But if somebody is willing to work but is not uh, as intelligent as Einstein, it's not his fault or her fault. Now, should we admit that uh, the labor is only for the most talented? This is an ethical question as well as a political question cannot be reduced to economic question. That is ridiculous. People having no culture. Because you see, either you admit that labor is only for the most talented, and then you can otherwise, but that is a, a, a position which is a racist, eh? apart from any other consideration. I mean, racism today, I remember what was the last speech, public speech, eh, done by John Paul II? That was November 29th of the year to, uh, 2004. November 29th, 2004. After that speech, eh, he had the operation here, and you remember, and uh, four months later, he disappeared. He went up. Now, in that speech, eh, he, he had a very modest voice because he was suffering, he pronounced, in my opinion, one of the most important speeches in the social doctrine of the church. He said, I quote by heart, because I learned it by heart, he said, the discrimination based upon efficiency is no less dangerous than discrimination based on religion, on sex, and uh, ethnic characteristics. A society which offers possibility of work only to the most efficient is not a humane society. And then he went on with other consideration. That was a, a terrific. In other words, efficiency, it's important. But is that the only judgment on the basis of which, or the only criterion on the basis of which you differentiate among people? So this is a uh, what today we call surplus people. That is an expression coined by the, the Canadian sociologist uh, Saskia Sassen. She published recently, last year, a book. Uh, the title was Expulsion. Expulsion. And he, she says in that book, uh, today we have a new category, surplus people. Who are surplus people? What I mentioned before, those who will never enter the labor process because they are so poor from the point of view of the ability, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that there will be no scope for them. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, you can say, a notion of waste. For, for instance, Pope Francis talked about waste, human waste. Exactly that. Now, surplus people are not unemployed. Eh? Because unemployed person is somebody who does not work today, but who has a perspective to work in one, two years' time. Surplus people are those who are put aside. And will never, in the same way, when you throw in the waste, the, uh, the, uh, the waste box, a piece of bread, nobody will eat it any longer, not even animals, because you have thrown there. 
here is the same. So that is uh, one problem which uh, uh, represents a real challenge today. A second problem has to do with the so-called financialization of the economy. Finance always existed. And as you know, I know to, that to certain people, certain people do not want to listen to that. But history is history. And uh, they told me that uh, truth is truth, has always the, to speak the truth. Because finance was born inside the Catholic uh, cultural matrix. And most, in particular, those who are Protestant, they believe the opposite, because they never studied. <laughs> because, you see, they do not know who created the first uh, financial instrument, modern instrument. Were well, the Franciscans, Perugia. They, they were called Mons Pietatis. They later became our banks. And they consider people like Bernardino from Siena, who created a major bank. Then eventually it went rotten. <laughs> In this, it's Monte dei Paschi di Siena. But he created, and the, think of Luca Pacioli, the one who invented the double, Luca Pacioli was a Franciscan. Uh, fra, uh, brother, not monk, eh, because Franciscans are not monks. Um, brother. Uh, and Luca Pacioli invented double, double booking, the, what today we call accountancy. When we study, we teach to our students how to keep the balance sheet, to prepare the balance sheets, nobody mentions that the first rules were fixed by Luca Pacioli, a Franciscan, etc. Because, you see, after the reforms, after Luther, etc., there was, uh, the, in Europe, this attitude. That everything which was Catholic should be abandoned. Uh, and so that is why most people believe that finance is a, a Protestant, uh, Protestant ethics. You remember the book by Max Weber. But this is not true. It's not true. It's not factually true. Of course, some people might dislike it, but uh, the truth is truth. Now, today, financialization of the economy means that uh, the financial side has overtaken the real side. You want a figure, a very recent estimate. At the world level, the amount uh, of financial assets is 700,000 billions of dollars. Billions, not millions, billions of dollars. 700,000, a number uh, longest. Now, of that, that amount is 12 times larger than the global GDP. Consider the GDP at the global level and compare with the, <coughs> the amount of financial ads, you have the ratio 1 to 12. And what does it mean? That, that finance is no longer an activity in very important to help the creation of wealth, the creation of value, but it's a self-referential helps only itself, because only 7% of the financial assets are used for the real side of the economy, 7%, 7%. And it would be enough to multiply by two the 7% to solve many problems of our society. So the problem is not that the finance is bad. No, finance is good. Finance is good. The point is that uh, in the last 30, 40 years, finance went astray outside uh, its uh, initial, uh, let's say, the, the original purpose for which uh, it was uh, created. And that is uh, one of the major explanations of increasing inequalities. Why inequalities in the last 40 years has increased as much as in the previous four centuries? This comes from the work of Angus Ditton, which is the last Nobel Prize winner in economics, American. He's not American by birth, but he lives in America. Angus Ditton, read his last book a few months ago. The title is the, the Great Escape, and he has data. In the last 40 years, the degree of inequality measured with the Gini coefficient is in, has increased as much as in the previous 400 years. So that poses a problem. One should ask, why is that so? Because even before finances existed, it means that something went wrong uh, along the way. 
Third problem. Today, we suffer out of a scarcity of commons and relational goods. In other words, uh, the phenomenon today is neoconsumerism. Now, neoconsumerism is responsible of the so-called phenomena, phenomenon of consumption distortion. Consumption distortion means that we consume too many private goods. I use private goods in the technical sense uh, of economic, and uh, too little common goods, commons. For instance, the environment is a common. Knowledge is a common. Uh, the, the culture is a common. And we, so we suffer in a, in a very irrational way because we consume too much uh, things of which we could do without, but we cannot consume those elements which will increase uh, our, let's say, flourishing. And we are prevent. That is uh, the phenomenon called distortions of consumption. And that is uh, the reason why many people, many voices today are against uh, these uh, new forms of consumerism, etc. Fourth element I mentioned before, the happiness paradox. Now, you know the happiness paradox was coined, uh, was uh, discovered, sorry, by the American economist uh, Richard Esterly. Now, Richard Esterly, still alive, he was in Rome the other day, uh, Sterling. He discovered in an article published in 1974 what nowadays, all over the world, every people knows to be the so-called uh, Sterling curve. Representing a happiness here, happiness index here, measured according to the American met Anglo-Saxon metric. I do not want now to enter into the details, as I mentioned already, that the different countries or different regions in the world have different cultural patterns. And so the metrics, the, the metrics or matrices have to be differentiated, which is not been done. But that is our fault. Because we keep silent, we do not study, we do not do research, and so the Anglo-Saxons do their job. It's not their fault, because they say we reflect our reality. How can we compel them to reflect our reality if we do not take care of ourselves? Close down. Now, representing here income per capita, y over n, that is income per capita, he obtained the curve which looks like this, more or less. Up to a certain point, which in his days, 74, he quantified in $22,000 per capita, per head per capita, increments of income per capita increased the happiness index. But beyond that, further increments of income per capita decreased that. That is the so-called happiness paradox. Now, today the literature on the happiness paradox is immense. There are something like 3,000 books published on that, 20,000 articles every single day in uh, departments, in different parts of the world appears that. Because that is problematic. I do not want exactly to enter into the technicalities, but the idea is the following. It's not true that uh, as you increase income per capita, you increase the well-being of people. Because in the well-being of people, there is uh, not only the material dimension, what I said before. That is why people talk about today human, in integral human development. By integral means that, of course, we need income. We need commodities uh, to, to consume. But we also need uh, the other two dimensions. For instance, uh, having a family, should have a, have a family be favored or not? When we know that family generates happiness. That is uh, a recent result stemming from the world work of John Halliwell. He's a nice man. He's a Canadian from Canada. Halliwell, if you, Halliwell with A, actually, with H, Halliwell. And he proved that uh, uh, couples in a marriage, ceteris paribus, considering the same level of income, eh, are happier than those unmarried. Now, we know what is the explanation of, of this uh, phenomenon. The explanation is that uh, human beings are not like animals. Animals have a stomach. Dogs have a stomach like ourselves. 
But this dog, a dog has no such a problem, provided that the, the dog can feel his stomach, it's okay. But we have not only a stomach. So if you have a model of development which only pays attention to the income per capita, income per capita means GDP, the result is that people become less and less happy with the consequences that you can easily imagine. Now, in other words, uh, our mainstream par economic paradigm is targeted to prospering, not to flourishing. But people want to flourish. Flourishing is the English translation of eudaimonia, which is the Greek word used by Aristotle to mean flourishing. You are happy when you flourish, not only when you expand in the quantitative dimension. Finally, the final problem, which is very serious, is the, a sort of inversion of the relations between the two spheres, spheres of politics and economics, as represented by the normal principle. The fact is that in the last few decades, the economic spheres is dominating the political sphere. Ah, that is the point. Because at the time, as I said before, Watley, he was a man of culture, he had at least, a, as I said, a pinch of truth in the separation. He, in my opinion, was wrong, but he had a pinch of truth. But what happened in the last 30, 35 years is that uh, the economic sphere is dominating the political sphere. In other words, our politicians, our parliaments, our governments, they do what the markets or the big financial institutions or the big lobbyists want them to do. Now, if I had time, I can produce a lot of evidence, but the empirical evidence, not theories, facts, uh, proving that. It's enough for you to read uh, Greenspan. Greenspan was, for many, many years, the president of Fed in the United States. Uh, now he retired to, uh, in the 2013. And then he published, no, before he retired, but in 2013 he published a book uh, of memories the title is The Territory and the Map. Go and read it. Where he describes uh, his experience as the most influential man in the financial sector in the United States of America. Go and read what he wrote. You can't believe. I couldn't believe. Then go and read uh, what, uh, for it, Tittmeyer. Tittmeyer was president of the Bundesbank in Germany for many years. Very influential. Go and read uh, his recent book. You wouldn't believe. And uh, of course, uh, if they have written, it means that, uh, I mean, what they have written is true because otherwise uh, somebody else would uh, penalize them, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So this is a serious problem. The problem is that democracy today is not performing the role that we expected the democratic rule. As you know, there are important distinctions two models of democracy electoral democracy and liberal democracy. Today, the liberal democracy is disappearing in favor of the electoral democracy. Electoral means if you get a consensus of 51%, you decide whatever. In other words, those in majority have the rights of modifying the rules of the game and modifying the value structure of the society. That's right. And they, there is no other guy. They would say, if you object, but we are in majority. Why would you object? We have passed this law. There is no need for me to make you actual examples because I'm sure that you are thinking to the same phenomena to which I'm thinking. And they would say, there is no point of discussing. Well, you can have your ideas, but we are in majority. That is electoral democracy. So we have to object saying that is not liberal democracy because liberal democracy means something different. The point is that people are so ignorant that they do not know the difference between the two models of democracy. And that is uh, dangerous. It's dangerous because look what happens in particular in the health sector, where certain groups of interest uh, direct the research in one direction instead of the other. The same applies to many other examples. I know. So in conclusion, you understand why confronting these uh, five groups of problems the growing gap uh, between uh, creative labor and uh, 
the problem of financialization of the economy, the problem of consumption distortion, the happiness paradox, and the inversion of the causal relationship between the economic sphere and the political sphere are posing new challenges. I do believe, but I am not the only one, that the mainstream economic paradigm, which we have inherited from, uh, let's say, recent past, the last, let's say, more or less century, is inadequate. I am not saying that is wrong. Eh? It's not a matter of being wrong or not correct. It's inadequate. So in other words, it's a paradigm which does not help eh, to find solution to the challenges I was talking about. And uh, it seems to me that uh, the civil economy paradigm, of which I've only mentioned a few, few basic things, eh, is in a, po a position to be able to uh, overcome. Now, final point, you might ask me, but are there signs indicating that we are moving in the direction I was talking about so far? Yes, provided that we open our eyes, eh? because if we do not read, we do not get acquainted, we conclude that is not, uh, that is not true. Let me mention a few facts. You know, ethical finance, sometimes uh, social finance. A few months ago, Oxford University Press has published the handbook on social finance, a book as big as that. Go and read it. Oxford University Press, where they describe all the uh, uh, experiments of uh, social finance Instead of calling it ethical finance, they call it social finance, but more or less is the same. And today, the ethical finance accounts for almost 20% of the total amount of financial assets. 20% is a minority, but it's something. Until 20, 25 years ago, it did not exist. Second, consider the fair trade. Fair trade is a novelty of, by the way, you know who created fair trade? was a Catholic priest, Catholic priest. And that is why some people are not very happy. <laughs> because for, for certain people, when they talk about they hear Catholicism, they become unhappy. Uh, what can you do? <laughs> uh, his name is Franz van der Hoeven. He's Dutch. Franz van der he's still alive. He was professor of economics in Paris. And many years ago, he went to Campesinos in Mexico, and he started that. Third, consider corporate social responsibility. Here, there is Dominic Bailey. He is a, an authority, a world authority in that area. Why corporate social responsibility today is accepted by everybody? I'm not saying that it's practiced by everybody, but it's accepted. I remember, since I'm an old man, that uh, 20, 25 years ago, it was almost impossible to talk about in our countries about corporate social responsibility. Because they said, corporations have only one responsibility, Milton Friedman, maximize profits at any cost. Today, nobody would subscribe to such a statement. So that is it. Now, another sign, more recent, is benefit corporations. Now, I realize that in Europe, we do not pay enough attention to that because we are a bit stubborn. Because Americans are Americans, are pragmatic. And Americans, when they observe that something goes astray, they change. We are a bit more, in Europe, ideological. You know that. Yeah. And in the year 2010, in America, they passed the law which has instituted this new figure, which is called benefit corporations. Going through. Now, Italy is the second country in the world. We passed a similar law last December. Last December. Uh, because, uh, I mean, some people operated uh, to convince the parliament, etc. Et now, what is a big corp? A benefit corporation is, uh, is not a philanthropic. Eh? Don't confuse a benefit corporation with philanthrop, corporate philanthropy, which always existed. It's a, a, a company like any other, which in its uh, statute, it's written in article number one, our purpose is double, not single. One is to obtain profits, which is okay. The other one is to generate social value in the area which has to be specified. Could be health, could be education, could be 
uh, environment, it could be cultural goods, everybody is free to choose. And uh, be careful, it's not the case that they devote part of their profits at the end of the year to this purpose. That is a philanthropy, which always existed. But uh, the firms utilizes its know-how and its expertise in order to achieve this other target. Now, this is a major novelty. And as you know, the theoretical mind behind the law was, has been Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winner in economics. Schiller is a wonderful person, Robert Schiller. He's a Nobel Prize technician, and he was the one who, at the beginning of the new century, started producing papers and books showing that it's not written in the tables, in the mosaic tables, that the corporation should maximize only profits. Well, who said so? A crazy people can say so. Because a corporation, it's uh, an institution created by human beings. So if it's an institution created, it does not come from the sky. And so if a human being decides to achieve a double purpose instead of a single purpose, why not? And in fact, uh, these are already almost 2,000 corporations in the States nowadays uh, have adopted uh, this new statute, etc. Another, uh, finally, consider humanistic management. That is uh, Barcelona, humanistic management. But uh, until recently, it was impossible to talk about humanistic management. So I could continue, but I finished my time, and so I have to stop. Another phenomenon is share, sharing economy. A sharing economy has to be studied, eh? because in my opinion, there are some ambiguities. But it's a new phenomenon. We should not hide, saying, oh, we don't. No, we have to study carefully, because it represents a novelty, sharing economy, which is uh, half a way between, let's say, the market and the communities, etc. So all uh, what I, I wanted to say is that uh, signs of major changes are already in our, uh, our disposal. What we need is to enhance this process. But to enhance, we have to think. And uh, considering that a dead thing can go with the stream, but only a living thing can go against it. We should never forget that. And to conclude, uh, uh, let me mention that uh, there are those with no hope in the future have only the present. And those who have only the present have no compelling reason to be interested in the future. And this kind of people will never take any interest in the challenges uh, confronting our societies. These are people dangerous, in my opinion. But fortunately, but fortunately, people who continue to entertain a hope in the future have not disappeared, as the people in this institute clearly show and demonstrate in practice. So continue along this path and many, many wishes uh, for your work and uh, for your important achievements. Thank you very much.